Greetings, Wilkinson here. This afternoon, my guest is Luke Yankee. Say hi, Luke. Hello there. Okay, let's start off with this. So you're a director, producer, playwright, author, TV, film, writer, a teacher, and a coach. And I probably missed some <laughs> stuff, but draw all those things. So Producer that, as well would yeah. be the other hat. Well, I started, oh, I said that. Oh, director I'm and sorry. Producer. Yeah, we got that. But anyway, <laughs> um, it begs the question, like, did something happen in your childhood where you... Is that the reason you're such a slacker? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, just president of the sloth committee there. <laughs> so of all those things, what is your favorite? I'll let you say two, two favorite. What you they? know, it really depends. I mean, my favorite is generally the one I'm working on at the time. Because right. that's where the energy is at the moment. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, at the moment, I'm really focused on playwriting. And so getting a great charge from that. But at other times, it could be directing or my recent book just came out. So it's a, it's a lot of different things. I love wearing a lot of different hats. So no, just favorite at the moment, huh? Yeah, my favorite du jour is playwriting. Is it? Okay, <laughs> I got it out of you then, okay. Right. <laughs> so you're working on a project right now? Well, uh, I've been working for a couple of years on a play called Marilyn Mom and Me, about my mother, Eileen Heckert, and her intense friendship with Marilyn Monroe during the shooting of the film Bus Stop. And what a lot of people don't realize, Wilkinson, is that the year before Marilyn did Bus Stop, which many people consider her her greatest role, she had taken the year off to study at the actor studio and she had become the epitome of the method actress where you have to feel everything organically and since my mother who was a well-known character actress at the time was playing her best friend in the film Marilyn was determined to make my mother her best friend and so at first my mother was thinking okay who's this starlet who's sort of glomming on to me and making me feeling uncom making me feel uncomfortable but then they really wound up bonding and so this play is not only about her intense friendship with Marilyn but it's also about how that impacted my relationship with my mother. So ultimately, it's a very intimate mother-son story. And I'm, I'm very proud of it. And it's getting tremendous response from uh, New York producers. And in fact, I'm having a reading in New York in about three weeks. And knock wood, there's a lot of interest. So I... What, what I, stage are you on that? Is it pretty well put together? Or? It, very much so, yes. So you're just polishing at this yes, point? Yes, yes. I've had a number of readings and workshops. So now I'm ready for the producers to come in and say they want to take it to the next level. I also have a production slated at uh, full production at International City Theater, which is the Equity Theater in Long Beach, where I live. And so that will be in February of 2024. And so uh, it's definitely moving forward, and I couldn't be more thrilled. So Marilyn hung out at your house sometimes? No, no, she no. didn't. Uh, they were shooting on location, uh, shooting bus stop on location in Phoenix. And so uh, I actually wasn't born yet, but my older brothers um, were little boys and they spent a lot of time hanging out on the set with Marilyn. And she wanted a child so desperately. I think they were two and four at the time and she just doted on those boys. She absolutely adored them. So there were a lot of wonderful family photographs of, uh, of Marilyn and my mother and my two brothers on the set. Yeah, I saw one when I was kind of digging around. One, she's holding your one yes, brother and the exactly. other one standing, right? Exactly, yeah. yes. Holding his I wonder where you were, but you were, you hadn't popped out of the oven yet. I had not. I was just a twinkle in the eye at that point. <laughs> Interestingly, so you've written a couple books. Yes. What were they? What are they? Um, so my first book was a memoir about the golden age of Broadway and Hollywood called Just Outside the Spotlight, Growing Up with Eileen Heckert. And it really is my mother's career through my perspective. And, you know, I, I did a lot of research on her early career, but then I, I just talk about it really from my perspective as her son. And uh, it's done very well. Mary Tyler Moore wrote the foreword to it before she passed. More recent one, which is actually just out about a month now month and a half maybe, is, uh, is a book called, the, a how-to book called The Art of Writing for the Theater, an introduction to script analysis, playwriting, and criticism, which are all the things I teach at uh, Cal State Fullerton, where I'm the head of playwriting, and I also teach at Chapman University. I teach playwriting and musical theater there. So in addition to the how-to aspects of the book, 
it also, because I was writing this during the pandemic and a lot of people were available who wouldn't normally have been, I have interviews with 18 world-class playwrights, librettists, critics, lyricists, people like David Henry Huang, Marsha Norman, Beth Henley, Sheldon Harnick, David Zippel. It's, uh, I'm really, really very proud of it. And it's getting, also getting tremendous response and doing quite well. Obviously you have energy right there. But I'm going to bring you back to the other book about your mother. Great. Sure. <laughs> so it's interesting because when I saw the title, I, I thought it referred to your mother being, I mean, I don't want to say second fiddle, but she, she, she was that's, definitely, she, that's, that's the role that she always seemed yes. to play. Mm -hmm. But then, I mean, I thought, well, that must be you in your mother's shadow. Very much and then, so. And then I saw something online where you actually talked about that. Yes, yes. It, it definitely has a double meaning. I mean, yeah. she played the second banana to Betty Davis, Paul Newman, so many people, Mary Tyler Moore, so many people over the years. And so it's about her being just outside the spotlight, but also since she was such a larger than life personality, it's very much about me being just outside of her spotlight and finding my own. And the long journey over the years to sort of find my own spotlight and, and find my own way uh, into show business without simply being the son of, uh, which has been a long journey and something I'm very proud to say I've, I feel I've accomplished. So that obviously launched you, the thought of that, into some of what you've done. Yes. But did it have a negative effect in any way or, or what do you think? Um, I think I started out as an actor and one of the few negatives, quote unquote, about that is the fact that when I would go in to meet a casting director, if they knew anything about my background and knew who my mother was, I found they expected more of me. And even though I was male and she was female, obviously, I still found they um, there was a great sense of competition and a great sense of feeling like I had to live up to the standards of this... Academy Award winning, Tony winning actress. And so that was, uh, that was a real challenge. So I, I actually felt when I stopped acting and started focusing on more, the first thing really was directing after acting. I really felt like I was wearing shoes that fit for the first time. And it was really nice to sort of step outside of that spotlight <laughs> and into a different one that could be more totally my own. Well, when I was perusing all you've done, seriously, I thought, wow, this guy is really creative. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed a lot of it. Let's talk about some of it. So what, what is Diva Dish? Uh, Diva Dish is a one-man show that I put together. And after my mother passed away, my brothers and I were going through the house and came across all of this incredible memorabilia from a 50-year career in show business. And I realized that I was the only one who really knew all of these stories, that I was really the keeper of the flame. So I put together this whole multimedia piece about this sort of crazy anti-mame kind of upbringing I had where Ethel Merman taught me how to make a martini at age 10 and Paul Newman gave me acting lessons in my parents' living room and fielding calls from reporters at age 13 the night my mother won the Oscar and encounters with everyone from Marlene Dietrich to Martha Stewart, uh, some of my mother's encounters with people like, um, as I mentioned before, Betty Davis and so uh, LBJ and so many other people over the years. So it's a really fun multimedia journey through the golden age of Broadway and Hollywood. And uh, I've done it on, I've done it in theaters. I've done it kind of, really kind of all over the world because I've also done it on more than 25 cruises all over the world. So it's kind of wonderful that I've gotten to see the world by telling mom's old cocktail party stories and a few of my own. How many stories are in that? Oh my goodness. I've never really counted. I actually, it was so popular and they liked it so much on the cruise ships that my booking agent asked me to create another one focusing on European celebrities. So I created Diva Dish the Second Helping. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> and so I've done that. In fact, I did that uh, out here in Palm Springs at, um, oh gosh, uh, is it not the Rainbow Cactus? the small uh, gay theater that uh, that was in Cathedral City for a while. I'm drawing a blank on the name, but I did it there for a, a run, and I've also done it on several cruises and uh, various other places around the country. One of the things I, I enjoyed watching, and maybe you can tell a little bit of the story, was 
your mother wanted a special Christmas dessert once. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you share a little about that? Yes, indeed. My mother had this Christmas party up in Connecticut, and there was a point in time where you sort of knew you had arrived in theatrical circles if you were invited to Eileen Heckert's tree trimming party up in Connecticut. And some of the people over the years who would come included Blythe Danner, uh, Paul Newman, and Joanne Woodward, Teresa Wright, Mary Tyler Moore. I mean, it was it, it was quite a star-studded affair. And one year, my mother decided she wanted this special dessert. And it was something she had seen at Marlena Dietrich's house years ago. It's something called a croquembouche, which is a tower of profiteroles that are shaped like a Christmas tree and held together. Uh, They're like balls of pastry. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Like, yes, balls of puff, puff pastry. Thank you. And so they're held together with spun sugar and rather difficult thing to make, very labor intensive. So she called all over till she could find a caterer who would agree to make one. And finally, this rather snooty woman, even over the phone, said, oh, yeah. Yes, I, I could make one of those for you. And if your party is on Sunday, well, I suppose I could have it for you by Wednesday. On Wednesday, my mother called and this woman said, well, I couldn't possibly have it for you today. I had a dinner for 200 at the UN last night. Call tomorrow. So she called the next day, still not ready. This went on and on until the day of the party. My mother was a nervous wreck. She wasn't going to have a dessert for her guests. So I drove over with her to this woman's house and long driveway and go into this very fancy kitchen with the copper pots hanging from the ceiling. And this woman is applying rosettes to a pastry, uh, from a pastry tube to a cake. And without even looking up, she says, yes, it's on the kitchen counter. You can leave the check in the wicker basket by the door. Carry it carefully. So we got into the car and I'm carrying the croquem bush for dear life, thinking, dear God, don't let me drop this. I'll be grounded for the rest of my life. And so my mother immediately lit a cigarette and she said, oh, that caterer was such a bitch. I will never do business with her again. I said, yeah, she did seem pretty uppity. What was her name anyway? Martha Stewart. Stewart. <laughs> and of course, before Martha Stewart became the institution that we right. know her as, she was a caterer in Connecticut. Many's the time as a child, I went to uh, uh, dinner parties or weddings or bar mitzvah, bar mitzvahs where Mar Martha Stewart would be running around uh, with the canapes and terrorizing the kitchen help. So how was it? The dessert? <laughs> it was amazing. Well, it tasted good. <laughs> yes, it did. Not many people <laughs> ate it because they were so afraid, you know, it was wow. just, it looked so gorgeous, but. Uh, so what do you, you just disassemble it from the top, work your way down. Is exactly. That it, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think my brothers and I wound up finishing it for about a, a for most of the Christmas holidays. Wow. That sounds <laughs> cool. So what I wasn't able to really get any details on, but the name intrigued me. So what is the Jesus hickey? Ah, <laughs> Um, years ago, I heard about this story, uh, and it was a totally fictitious story, probably in the National Enquirer or someplace like that, about this little girl who got a hickey in the shape of Jesus and became a big celebrity. So I wrote this play about a little Irish girl who goes out necking with her boyfriend and, in fact, gets a hickey in the shape of Jesus and develops mystical healing powers. And people are coming from all over the world to experience the magic healing powers of the Jesus hickey. And so I did it in, uh, I directed a, a production in L.A. with Harry Hamlin playing the girl's father, who was wonderful. Harry has remained a dear friend. And uh, uh, it was very successful. It's a very bawdy comedy. And people hear the title and they're like, What? And when I explain what it's about, people usually say like, oh my God, that's hysterical. So it, it's just one of many projects I've done over the years. That well, What uh, year was that? For? I believe that was around 2007. Yes. And then one I, another one I wasn't able to really get into, but it seemed different from anything you've done is uh, The Man Who Killed the Cure. Yes. What, what's that about? Yes. Um, about... Now, is this a play or a book? Or this what? is a play. Okay. This is a play. I've also written a screenplay version of it. And about 10 years ago, I became vegetarian and sort of became obsessed with natural healing and watched a number of videos uh, on the subject. And there was one where there was this woman uh, named uh, Charlotte Gerson, this very intense German lady. And something about her energy just really, really struck me. And, and with this thick German accent, she's saying, how can you grow a decent tomato when there are no nutrients in the soil? And I just, I had to know more about her. So long story short, uh, I realized that she was the daughter of a man named Max Gerson, who was one of the fathers of natural healing who developed an all-natural cure for cancer in the early 1950s 
with a very specific combination of, of juicing, organic fruits and vegetables, and organic coffee enemas to flush out the system. And he cured in the late, uh, late 40s, early 50s, he cured over 50 people of terminal illnesses, um, tuberculosis, arthritis, uh, cancer, any number of things through this very specific method of juicing and the coffee enemas. And he started to write a book about this and the AMA and Big Pharma got wind of it. And of course, there's no money in curing people from fruits and vegetables. So they hired a woman to pose as a secretary and sabotage the book. And by the time he found out, it was too late. I mean, there was no photocopying or anything back then. So he started writing the book from scratch. And just as he finished the book the second time, he mysteriously died of arsenic poisoning. Really? Yes. And this is a true story. And so, but his daughter, Charlotte, the one I saw in this documentary, without becoming a doctor herself, she had worked side by side with her father. So she became a consultant to clinics in Tijuana and various places around the world because, you know, it was illegal to do that here to cure cancer without chemo or radiation, which I am not a fan of. But um, by the time Charlotte Gerson died when she was, I believe, 92 or 93, she had cured over 10,000 people of just about every illness imaginable from AIDS to all types of cancers to everything else by using this technique. And so I became absolutely obsessed with this. And so basically, there are several books out about Max Gerson, and I became very friendly with his grandson. So wrote this play, The Man Who Killed the Cure, about basically his, it, it's sort of an Amadeus-like story about a man who was his uh, colleague uh, in his uh, medical practice, who basically uh, somewhat of a fi fictitious character, was a, uh, an amalgamation of several other people in his life, but who basically in cahoots with Big Pharma and the AMA conspired to destroy Max Gerson which is ultimately, of course, what happened. So there's no revival on his stuff? Um, you mean on, on... Yeah, I mean, it, you'd think... I mean, people are going to hear about that. Well, he does have... I mean, the book was was published and okay. is in many different languages. And still, uh, the Gerson Method is used in a number of clinics. Uh, there's a Gerson Institute in San Diego. And uh, oh, this so is... There, it is in the U.S.? Not... Well, as a clinic. Uh, I mean, as a... Uh, let me rephrase that. As an institute. Because... Uh, there are they've sort of found ways around it but they all also have to have all their disclaimers saying now this isn't certified medical evidence and all of that because otherwise they would have you know all, all the medical authorities breathing down their necks right. but in fact this is very successful and it it has cured lots of people the medical pharma thing wow it's it's huge definitely i, I was going to ask you um you were in new york originally yes when did you move to the west coast uh, I, when I first, I, I started out in New York, I studied acting at Juilliard and then, uh, finished, uh, my degree at NYU and then, uh, moved to the West coast the day before the Northridge earthquake. Talk about timing. Wow. And so I've, I've been, I believe that was 92 or 90, early 93, I think. And so I've been on the West coast since then and, um, came out here to pursue work directing, uh, film and television and spent that first year shadowing shadowing a bunch of uh, television directors and meeting with showrunners and that sort of thing. And then on a whim, I applied for the job as the artistic director of the Long Beach Civic Light Opera, which at the time was one of the biggest musical theaters in America. And uh, the short story is I got it. <laughs> and uh, had a, a wonderful recommendation from Hal Prince, the great Broadway director, which kind of sealed the deal. So uh, I ran the Long Beach Civic Light Opera for a year and then uh, moved on and, and went back to uh, freelance directing because one of the little things they didn't tell me when I took on the mantle is that with a $4 million operating budget, they had a million dollar deficit. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, we oh, forgot you have to, to tell you this. With a million bucks. Yeah, exactly. So I was doing a really good job of of turning it around with the help of my associate producer Don Hill, who went on to become my husband of twenty seven years. But uh, but unfortunately, it was too far gone. So I I was sort of a band aid on a broken leg. But did some wonderful work there, and it really established me in the L A. theater community. And so I've been 
freelance directing, producing, and, you know, all the other hats I wear kind of ever since. And you live in Long Beach now. Yes, I live in Long Beach, and uh, I'm the head of playwriting at Cal State Fullerton, and I also teach playwriting and musical theater at uh, at Chapman University. Where'd you meet your husband? Uh, actually, when we were running the Long Beach Civic so Light Opera. So that is where you met? Yes, yes. He was, he was the associate producer, and he was actually up for the job as well. And I thought, oh, dear God, if anybody's in a position to pull an Eve Harrington and stab me in the back, because he's been here for five years. He knows where all the bodies are buried. I know nothing. But... So you figure I'll, I'll date him and then I can <laughs> avoid that, right? <laughs> well, we just hit it off like gangbusters. And, and in the first year, we saved the theater over $60,000. But the administrative overruns, unfortunately, were just too great. Yeah, there was a point in time where we sort of went, yeah, I'd like my next relationship to be like this. And oh, yeah, I'd like to do this differently. And, and do this like this and not realizing that we were actually planning our future together. Wow. So uh, he is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. 27 years later, we're still going strong. So when you first met him, how long before you said, oh, there's something here? When we first met, there was a spark. But it was like, oh, no, 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 this is my associate producer and I can't go there and all of that. So we, we kind of did that dance for about uh, six months. But then... <laughs> One thing led to another. <laughs> and uh, actually, that's kind of a wonderful story, Wilkinson, about there was one night, the theater was really in dire straits. And uh, it was my first production as producer, a big elaborate production of The King and I with Lee Merriweather and George Chakiris. And so uh, we both had to stay till after the show. I had He had to give a VIP tour and I had to meet some big donor or something. So we're walking down by the Long Beach Marina and walking by the boats and the sun Sunlight, or that, the moonlight, rather, is coming up over the water, and it was lots of stars in the sky. It was very romantic. And I suddenly said to him... You couldn't have created a better scene, right? Indeed. <laughs> and, and I suddenly said to him, okay, let's stop talking about the theater. Enough shop talk. Uh, tell me about your goals. Tell me about your dreams. Where do you want to be five years from now? And he took a deep breath, and he said, well, I hope this won't freak you out or scare you away, but five years from now... I'd like to be married to you. I'd like to be your husband. Wow. And so we calculated five years from that date, and that was when we had our commitment ceremony. Wow. Throw it out in the universe and it'll come back to you, baby. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. And in fact, the wonderful uh, New Thought minister, Reverend Duchess Dale, who was still a dear friend who performed the ceremony, said, you may think you know why you're here, but let me tell you why you're here on this actual date. And she told that story. And so it was every... actually five years? It was. Wow. Yes. It was pretty much five, pretty close to five years to the day. Wow. Yes. What do you like about him? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Uh, the first thing that connected me to him is, is that we have a strong spiritual base. He is the most loving, caring, generous, beautiful man inside and out that I've ever met. And in fact, when my mother, shortly before she passed, said to me, is Don Hill the new man in your life? And I said, yeah. And you know what, Mom? I think I've met my Jack Yankee. Because wow. my parents were married for 57 years and they were inseparable. And my father was just uh, an incredible man. And, and Don has a lot of the same qualities as my father. When did your father pass? In, oh gosh, uh, somewhere around, I believe it was 1989, I think. Somewhere okay. around in there. Yeah. Well, so let's push the reverse button here. So <laughs> go back to when you, when did you figure out you were gay? I think I kind of always knew, but when, um, uh, I, I think, uh, <laughs> when I was doing shows in, um, in, in high school, you know, there would be sort of a big communal dressing room and I thought, oh dear, I'm, <laughs> I'm in big trouble here. I, <laughs> I, I, I better get dressed really quickly so people can't see that I'm getting excited. So... <laughs> <laughs> was it co-ed or not the men in one room and... no it was all the men in one okay. room and i remember we were doing of course one could never get away with this now but we were doing a big production of the king and i and you know all these waspy connecticut boys and girls and so we all had to wear body makeup so you know there i am in the, in the big it was the band room actually with you know all these 16 and 17 18 year old boys in their briefs and i just thought oh dear god it's a good thing i'm wearing really baggy pants <laughs> did you have a word for gay at that point yeah yeah so you knew what it was mm -hmm, exactly 
Exactly. Being in the theater. And well, all, right? I, and the irony is, I mean, I, I was really, I was bullied a lot in school because of being in theater and, you know, they called me a theater fag and all of that. And by the time I really figured it out and, and really was gay, they got bored and moved on. So they had stopped calling me that by the time it was really <laughs> the truth. <laughs> did you have a coming out with your mother or did she know or what? You know, I think a mother always knows. And yet I did have a coming out with my parents. You know, one would think with my mother being in the theater and that so many of her best friends, her directors, her dressers, etc. But it was different when it was her fair haired youngest child and her kind of golden boy. Well, and the youngest one is always gay. Come on. She should have <laughs> known that. <laughs> exactly. But they, especially my mother, didn't take it well and said a lot of pretty hurtful things, extremely hurtful things. How old were you when you told her? 17. Okay. Yeah. And that was kind of stupid of me to sort of come out that young when I was still living at home and under their roof and everything. So you came out to both of them at the same time? I did. I did, yes. I kind of sat them down and and told them. They they had their suspicions and they had been, you know, they had made some comments. And I thought, okay, I sort of need to address this head on. I don't think I've ever said this before in an interview, but my mother's exact words were, it repulses me, it disgusts me, and I will never accept it. Wow. And there's kind of not a lot of room you can go from there. And so we went through a very tense time and a very difficult period for those last, that last year or so before I moved out of the house. And then ultimately she came around and one of her friends, um, a very wise, very maternal Jewish lady said to her, Eileen, I know how much you love this boy and do you want to lose him? Because if you keep it up, he's going to walk and you're never going to see him again. So I put a variation of that scene into Marilyn Mom and Me, as a matter of fact, because it's a highly autobiographical piece. So flash forward a number of years. And like I said, slowly, they sort of came around over time. Uh, let me interrupt. So you, how did your father take it at that point? He was, he was very quiet okay. and he just kind of suffered in silence. And God bless him, he was so dear and kind of naive in that he would say things to friends like, if only I'd played more ball with him. (laughs) (laughs) Which I think a lot of men in that generation probably thought. Well, you know, reparative therapy, that's... They teach that stuff. Right, yeah. exactly. So, like, but, no, you know, if, if, if he had uh, played more baseball with me and all of that, that that, uh, that that would have changed things. So flash forward a number of years, uh, my mother knew that she was terminal, but uh, hadn't told anyone yet. And they had, uh, both my parents had met Don and my father had since passed, and they were very fond of him. My mother said to me, now listen, uh, I have to ask you something, but I'm afraid. And this woman who gave the appearance of never being afraid of anything, I said, well, what, what is it? You can ask me anything. And she sort of hemmed and hawed and said, do you think Don would want to call me mom? And I said, well, I think he'd be very touched. You can ask him yourself when we come home for Christmas. No, I'd be too afraid of the rejection if he said no. So you, you <laughs> ask him and you tell him what you, you tell me what he says. So he, I t- called him at his office and he called an hour later, called her and said, hi, mom. And she said, oh, that's what I wanted to hear. And boy, talk about the wheel coming full circle. It was kind of amazing. And then a few months later, when she was, she was determined to get through one last Christmas. And in fact, she died on New Year's Eve. Um, at Christmas, she was very doped upon morphine because she was in so much pain. And, and she kept saying, she was getting very agitated, saying, something's missing. There, there's one more gift for Dawn. So, something's missing. We said, don't, don't worry, Mom. We'll, we'll find it. It's okay. And then three days after she died, we found the gift, which was a letter opener. She had had monogrammed, and on the front it had his initials, and on the back it said, Love, Mom. Wow. And, of course, he cried buckets when he saw it. But uh... Well, I have tears right now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's something. <laughs> but God bless her for, for coming around, too, because uh, the friend who told her she would have lost me, frankly, I think was right. But, you know, again, a different era, a different generation. And uh, even though she was in the theater and very savvy in some ways, in other ways, she was still this small town girl from Columbus, Ohio, who didn't really understand certain things, you know? Right. So your latest book, again, is what? The Art of Writing for the Theater. So if I buy that book and I read it a few times, so you're guaranteed I can write 
a play that <laughs> absolutely it has all the how to's on script analysis and these wonderful quotes from people like David Henry Huang and Marsha Norman and all these Pulitzer Prize winners yeah I'm I'm very proud of it and uh, it's in fact I'm also teaching from it as well so my students are learning from my book which is which is very exciting wow quite a life and it continues to be. What are you most excited about right now? I am most excited about Marilyn Mom and Me. And as I mentioned, in, th- in about two and a half weeks, actually, I'm doing this reading in New York for uh, a number of Broadway producers. And one in particular has already asked me for budgets and has already said that he wants to uh, take me to lunch the day after reading the reading to talk about the play. And this is a Tony-winning producer, so I think that's that doesn't sound like lip service that's to me. That's a pretty good sign. Yeah, <laughs> he's already seen a video of it and um, uh, is already you know, and also sees the commercial potential of a piece that is not only this intense mother-son drama, but also has all these stories about Marilyn Monroe that no one has ever heard before. Where did I see this? So I saw a scene. There's an actress that's playing Marilyn. Yes, yes, and, and my mother. Who yeah. are those women those and how, how did that come about? Those actresses are uh, Alicia Soper, who plays Marilyn Monroe, and uh, Laura Gardner, who plays uh, my mother, Eileen Heckert. And uh, it's, you know, I was um, I was talking about this play, and I was talking to a friend of mine, a wonderful actor named Brian Rohan, and I was saying, you know, I, I you're one of the only people I can think of who, who I think could be a really good choice to play me. They played a 40-something Luke, who's a major character in this play. Wait, and, you don't want me to do it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> it's already cast. Sorry, right, Wilkinson. Right, sorry. Well, fine. <laughs> but, but um, uh, and he said, well, when the time comes, I know the perfect per- person to play Marilyn Monroe. She works at Universal Studios as Marilyn, and yet she's never had a chance to play a role as Marilyn. And so she's done all the research, and it's uncanny how much. I, I mean, when she walks on stage, there's an audible gap in the audience and I was one of my plays was done for um uh, a theater festival, the uh, Valdez Theater Conference in Valdez, Alaska. I flew up there and was part of the festival, had a wonderful time, and saw this actress who had been part of the festival for a number of years, and I thought, wow, she really has a lot of the same qualities of my, as my mother, and she could be a really good Eileen. And so the minute I got back, she started pestering me, going, where's the script? Where's the script? It's like, Laura, I haven't written it yet. Take a chill pill. So, <laughs> but that also gave me a lot of impetus to write it that much faster. Right. And uh, so, God bless her, she's done so much research. And, and even now, three years later, she'll still, she will still say to me, uh, send me that Playhouse 90 of your mother's from 1953 and and you know send me this from the 70s and I want to watch her episodes of the Mary Tyler Moore show again and and all of that so uh, she's really done her homework and it's eerie how much she channels my mother I mean the first time my husband Don heard her he's like holy shit my mother-in-law's back and I wasn't prepared for that <laughs> I mean she's the two of them are quite extraordinary the whole cast is really I'm, I'm now, really thrilled now would they be in a, on stage, or is that for a future movie that you would have these two? Well, I mean, I, they or will, they're your suggestion. They, they're definitely but... going to do it at uh, the Long Beach Playhouse. Okay. Uh, when we, I'm sorry, not the Long at, at International City Theater in Long Beach. Sorry, okay. when we do the full production there. Beyond that, I would love to have them, you know, continue to be involved with it. But some of that is out of my hands and has to do right. with producers and that sort of thing. But they're both absolutely brilliant in these roles, and I, I really. You know, can't imagine anyone better. So I saw this short scene where Marilyn and your mother are talking, Mm -hmm. and she talks about people calling her Hecky, which was her nickname. The character says she didn't, she never liked that. Is that is that true? That is true. Yeah, it was a nickname that that kind of stuck with my mother, and and anybody who had known her for a long time in the business called her Hecky, but she never really liked that nickname. But it became kind of a moniker. In fact, one of my favorite silly stories about that nickname, there are many, but is that Carol Channing came to see her in something on Broadway and came backstage wearing a full tuxedo. And Carol Channing turned to my mother with those amazing huge eyes in, in her full tuxedo and said, Hecky, you don't think this looks too dikey, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I always love the the rhythmic right. quality of Hecky right. and Dikey, you know. Right. right. 
<laughs> well, having been called Winky or Wilkie, I get oh it. Oh my, no, I'm sure I, you do. I don't like that. No, <laughs> I hated being called Lukey. Lukey? You know, certain of those those ants who would come up and pinch your cheek and say, oh, my little Lukey. Hated that. Hated that. Still do. <laughs> well, of course, it is not as bad when I was younger. They called me Chicken Arm. Oh, dear. I couldn't throw a ball. (laughs) Nor could I. Talk to my father. (laughs) It's his fault. And that's what made you gay, the fact that you couldn't throw a baseball, right? right? Yeah, that's the only reason, yes. So what were you uh, afraid of that I might ask you? (laughs) Anything? (laughs) I I want the dirt. Come on. (laughs) I can't really think of anything. No, I'm, I'm a pretty open book. I really enjoyed looking at everything, and I'll be... Like I bought a couple of your books. So I'm going to start reading them. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. So I always end these with what have you learned in your life? What advice or tidbits could you give my listeners? Hmm. Life advice? Is that what you're looking yeah. for? What's your motto for yourself? What, <sighs> what can you pass on and remind people of? Probably nothing's new under the sun, but what could you remind them? The thing that I would love to most remind people of is one of the things that my mother said... It's one of the last things she said to me. She said, the most important thing in life is to be kind. And that is advice I really try to live by. I can't think of anything really more important than than being kind to other people. Well, you seem like a really good guy. We just met today, but I've totally enjoyed it. Likewise. Thanks for coming in. My great pleasure. Thank you so much. You're welcome.